So uh, I want to congratulate you guys coming today. Just, just think about it. You drove all the way over here. And what are we going to talk about? Death and taxes, nursing home expenses, families torn apart, and that your plan might not work, right? And we're talking about estate planning. Those are the kind of things we have to, have to worry about, or lack of estate planning in some cases. And of course, you know, we've met before, but just a little background. Um, I, was, uh, I was in the Army for 20 years. And so I retired from the Army, and the next month I started law school at St. Mary's in San Antonio. It takes three years to get out of law school, so in 92 is when I graduated from law school. And then uh, the reason we moved to Houston was because I had passed a CPA exam. But you can't be a CPA until, unless you work for a CPA. So Arthur Anderson was a huge accounting firm. And remember, they got, they got run out of business during the Enron. Oh, yeah. But when I went to work for them, they were still the largest accounting firm in the United States. And so I worked for them for two years. That's why we moved to Houston. And then I started the, the estate planning law firm. And so ever since 1994, we've been doing estate planning and probate okay. uh, here in, in this area. And our office has always been at Greenpoint. So over the years, we've had a chance to help thousands of Texas families protect their, uh, their loved ones and their resources. And so that's the reason I'm still doing it because I think this is great work. And uh, Stephanie's been with me since 1996 and Kathy since 2000. Mary's been here for a number of years. So we want to have, uh, always have staff that's got experience and been uh, that's, you know, able to help families. So this is our calling and we want to help, help you maintain and up your, update your plan. So uh, here are the eight deadly mistakes that, that we're going to talk about. One is that people don't keep up with changes of the law and regulations. Another one is that they're not updating their plan to reflect family changes. Another one is that there's no plan to deal with nursing costs. Number four is funding is not maintained or updated. And what we mean by that is that any time you're thinking about your estate plan, You've got to make sure all of your different assets, your IRAs, life insurance, accounts, uh, home, and everything is going to flow the way you want it to flow to your beneficiary. A lot of times that's not taken into consideration and all kinds of mistakes and trouble uh, happen if that, that's not done. With a trust, you want the property, a lot of the property is going to be in the trust to avoid probate. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing will-based planning, you still have to think about this because most families have three kinds of property, and it, it may go in different directions if we're not paying attention. Um, another thing is that people, a lot of, they'll set up their estate planning and they'll think, okay, I got all the pieces set up, and then later they get other assets or other accounts, and they don't, they don't think about, okay, wait a minute, how's this fit in? Who's gonna get this account? Does this flow the way we want it to? Um, and then what we see uh, with a lot of a lot of families are that the, the financial assets that they have aren't really suitable for their goals. And so during retirement or during the process of saving, they uh, do a poor job or they don't get the benefits that, they, that it would be nice for them to get. Um, another problem that occurs with families is that the the uh, senior people don't talk about their planning with their kids when that would have been appropriate to do. Because sometimes you can avoid all kinds of problems by letting the family know what to expect, right? <laughs> so sometimes that can be very important. And then another one is that the plan doesn't reflect family values or life lessons. And so I, I see you found it. We've got uh, copies of some of the slides there, so if you need to make notes or anything yeah. uh, during the talk. So one of the quick things is we just don't, we, we don't keep up with changes in the law, and of course, the change in the laws all the time. It seems like, you know, when you're watching TV that all they do is talk up there about stuff, but apparently on the side they do pass some laws, and tax laws are very popular, and tax laws are very popular. Every, every, in, our, in our system, every group imaginable wants to have some favorable tax law for them, right? And so as a result, they've got this gigantic conglomeration of rules for the tax code. And then if, it, if that wasn't bad enough, then of course we have all these um, IRS employees that write regulations to carry out the law that the lawmakers did. And so you end up with these gigantic uh, regulations. So in the, I think the state in the, uh, the tax laws are like 75 or 80,000 pages, which is probably excessive. <laughs> 
<laughs> but anyway, and then they change the laws. Sometimes it's for it's for good, and sometimes not so good, depending on your outlook. Mm -hmm. This last year, they raised that standard deduction. They doubled it. So for married couples, it went from twelve thousand to twenty-four thousand. Mm -hmm. Well, that cut everybody's tax mm -hmm. just about. Mm -hmm. So that was that was helpful for most people. And so we do quite a few tax returns in the law firm. And most of our clients had their tax uh, bills go down. Mm -hmm. now, sometimes people don't quite understand it because between their withholding, really what they sense is just I either had to pay more in or I got more back. Mm -hmm. and then, you know, but uh, uh, when we looked at the, the summaries on some of the tax returns that, that we prepared in the law firm, every one of those clients that I looked at, their taxes were lower this year than last year. So that was a good thing for a change. Mm -hmm. um, now the states also have rules, and this doesn't, uh, it says state estate administration laws. They're talking about death taxes in states. So first thing to say is, you know, death taxes, that's the estate tax. And the good news for most Americans is they don't owe any estate tax because now the estate tax exemption is so high that very few Americans have to pay it. Your exemption is 11.4 million, and yours is 11.4 million, so you can leave 22.8 million dollars to your kids with no estate tax. However, in some of the states in the upper Midwest and on the east and west coast, the states have their own death tax. And so even though the, the federal exemption is so high, I've had clients that, that inherited like uh, farmland in Illinois and stuff, and they had to pay estate tax when their parents died. But Texas doesn't have any debt taxes, so we don't have to worry about that for the most part. Put another way, if you have to pay a state tax, federal estate tax, you are blessed indeed. <laughs> That's your blessing, right? Um, so, um, so anyway, they can change a lot, a lot of things. We were just talking about the income tax planning things. But it also affects other things. So for instance, uh, just for one, it's been important, and you'd be surprised how many people still don't have this. One of the documents that everyone needs is a health care voucher, because this is how you say that if, if, if I'm in the hospital and I can't um, speak for myself, or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to get better, but right now I'm post-operative, or I'm so sick I can't talk, uh, the doctors and hospitals want to know who, do, who you want them to talk to mm -hmm. in the event that uh, you can't speak for yourself. So that's why you have that health care but there's a second part of it now. Begin in 2003, they passed a law and they said nobody can touch your medical records unless you give them authority to do it. Mm -hmm. So now what we want to do is make sure that in that healthcare power, there, there's not only that business about who, who's going to talk to the doctor for you, but we also want to give that person power to access your medical records. Okay? So that's an example of where the laws change sometimes, and that needs to be put in those documents. A financial powers of attorney are extremely important. If you did Medicaid uh, planning for loved ones in the past, one of the first things we brought up was we have power of attorney on this, right? right. And then uh, uh, in Texas, they're called statutory durable powers of attorney. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can be called other things, but an awful lot of them are called that. Because there's a statute that says, here's some suggested language. What this makes people think is, they think, well, all of these must be the same. Well, believe me, they're not the same. And in our practice, we get to see all kinds and varieties of these because we're always asking that question. If you got power of attorney, we take a look at it. And remember, in, in, when we're doing Medicaid planning, two of the powers that we're looking for are gifting power, if we're going to have to have a transfer strategy, we need gifting power. And sometimes we need power to create trust. Well, those aren't in most of these powers of attorney. And, and, it's, and if they're not there, you just don't have them. So it's very important to uh, have power of attorney that has, has those powers. And another aspect of this is that some people do powers of attorney and they say, this power of attorney, I only want it to go into effect once I become disabled. And that, remember, this is the, the point of this document is to let somebody deal with your, your, your financial affairs if you were disabled. That's why you're doing this. Um, 
But a lot of times people write them and it says, only when I'm disabled do I want it to go into effect, which sounds like it might be right, but it is wrong. Because the problem is, if you all set them up that way or, or parents set it up that way for you, you're going to have to get letters from a doctor saying you're disabled before you can use that power of attorney. Mm -hmm. So it just makes it extremely cumbersome if they put it. So the way you want these powers of attorney to work, you want them to go into effect immediately and you just you you have you you expect your agent to have enough sense that they're not going to mess with your accounts until you you need their help mm -hmm. right you know, or put it another way if you don't trust them don't make them power of attorney <laughs> okay so but anyway that's a, another that's certainly if you have to do one of these power if you have to use one of these powers of attorney and somebody's put on there that it only goes into effect when they're disabled, they have just created an additional problem for you because you're going to have to get a letter from a doctor before you can use it at the bank. Thank you very much. Um, okay, another aspect of these laws are that sometimes they give us a new opportunity. It solves a problem we couldn't solve before. So Medicaid rules change from time to time. The most recent thing that's happened in, in Medicaid, or the big, I mean, there's a lot of changes, but one of the changes that's most significant is that now individual retirement accounts, which used to be countable, are not countable if the person is over 70 and a half. Now remember what happens at 70 and a half, that's when you have to start taking minimum or required minimum distributions out of your IRA or 401k or you all have IRAs, 401ks, 457 Bs, all, all those kinds of retirement plans you have through your employer. Uh, is what I'm talking about. Any of those plans, once a person is 70 and a half, they have to start taking minimum required distributions. Well, it turns out if that's the situation, that's not considered countable against them if they're trying to qualify for Medicaid. Right. In the past, if you had a big IRA where you couldn't qualify for, for uh, Medicaid unless you jump, did double back flips. You have to do a bunch of stuff in order to do it. It's yeah. painful, expensive, and uh, not very good tax planning. Now those things, those IRAs are just off the table. So this is a, a change that would allow a lot more people to qualify, a lot more middle class people to qualify. And that's a Texas law. Um, so that's a, some stuff about laws. Let's see, I might, uh, the second mistake, a state plan is not updated to reflect family changes. Well, now you kind of get the, the, the idea here. We have uh, our kids get married and divorced. We have new grandkiddos. People break up and people die. And so uh, if, those, if those impact your existing will or your existing trust, they, they may need to be fixed sooner rather than later or something odd is going to happen in your plan or it'll cause some, some difficulty or it'll just it'll um, uh, create a problem because what you intended isn't going to happen because that person's not there or the circumstances have changed. Um, so we need to, to watch that. And you would be surprised how many times I've had this situation where people um, went several years with some really key change, a key change they need to make before they came in and made the change. So it's, and, and you know why that is, with estate planning, it is so easy to put it off. You know, we have all these things we have to do every day, and we've got to get it done, we've got to get it done, got to get it done. This estate planning change is really important, but it doesn't have to be done today, right? And then it just gets postponed, postponed, postponed. So it's important to, once you think about this hard, and like a meeting like this is a good chance to think, here's some things we need to. Okay, so if we get new new beneficiaries, this may be a, a reason why we want to make some changes to our will or to our trust. Um, an update may mean adding or removing beneficiaries or simply changing the distribution amounts. It can not only affect your will or trust, but in, depending on what it is, it might affect the beneficiary designations on IRAs, 401ks, and so forth. So another thing that comes up, so many times 
we've had clients and they would have their daughter's name and she's married now so they have her the daughter's married name in their documents and a few years later they come back and they say I never want to see that guy that name again in my life put put, put it back to her maiden name right so the, the no good son-in-law's name needs to be out of there so uh, So it says if your child or grandchild is married, uh, you can protect their inheritance in case of their own divorce with the right provisions of planning in your, your trust or will. With the proper planning, you can prevent up to 50% of your assets from walking out of the door of the future ex-in-law. So uh, this is very appealing to clients to be able to, to protect their children from possible divorces in the future. In other words, if, if, we, if, if we are gone and we leave our children an inheritance, We'd like for it to stay in our own family line and not go to that uh, the uh, ex-son-in-law or daughter-in-law. Now, if if, uh, if somebody receives an inheritance in Texas, an inheritance is separate property by definition. I mean, Texas has community property and separate property. Community property is property that's acquired during the course of marriage and anything it turns into. So if either spouse earns any money during the marriage, it's community property. Mm -hmm. And the other spouse owns half of it, whether their name's on the account or not. Mm -hmm. okay. In a divorce, you split the community property. But you don't split the separate property. Your separate pro and so what's separate property? It's property you inherit, mm -hmm. that you had before the marriage that you could identify, or that you received as a gift. So at first blush, it sounds like the fact that it's an inheritance, it would be protected in a divorce. But if the person receives the property, so if, if you leave, uh, if, if a daughter receives an inheritance and she puts that in a joint account with her husband, there's an argument that when she puts it in a joint account with her survivorship, she made a gift of half of it to him at that time. So that's not a very happy thought. Second thing is that in Texas, joint accounts are uh, presumed to be community property. So that's not a really good place to start your divorce discussion. Also, the income from separate property, like dividends, reinvested uh, uh, interest, and so forth, that's uh, community property. So if they, were, if they just saved it in an account, you just sat there and they saved it and it, it earned interest and dividends, now there's this component that's community property. Well, people in a divorce can fight over that for a long, long time, right? Even though it may not be that, that much money. But it, and it'll lead to a settlement. Or another thing that can happen is that in many cases the husband and wife would have a joint savings account. They put this inheritance in the joint savings account. Some years go by, during which time they put their own money into this account and they buy uh, a new car with some of it or buy a new house with some of it. And so when they divorce, then it's less clear what part was inheritance and what part was not. And so then they're going to get in a big fight about what was what, and ultimately they'll, after, after the fight and the expense of trying to calculate this, then they'll have a settlement. And the, and the answer is that the one that inherited the stuff is going to lose part of it in that proposition. So that is a very unsatisfactory scenario if it happens, right? So how can you prevent this? Well, what you do is you create a trust for your son or daughter, and if, if, if you do that correctly and the kid whatever stays in that trust never picks up any community property. So it's like you gave them a prenup to whatever they retain in that trust. So that's, that's what we're talking about here. Mistake three, no plan to avoid nursing home costs. Well, you guys sort of, you all have seen the game here. And what we tell clients is, and what the sad thing is, and we see this all over and over again, where the family has essentially spent tens of thousands of dollars on nursing home before, in many cases, they're already in the last, they're at the end of mom or dad's money. And that's when they come to see us. Because the nursing home was very happy to receive that private pay until it was almost gone. And then they say, you might want to go check with the bond law firm see if you can qualify mm -hmm. for Medicaid. Well, they could have qualified for Medicaid a long time before that if they come to see us. And in other cases where the family's initially facing it, the cost of long-term care. Now, usually the family is tremendously stressed out because they're worried about mom or dad, and they've just gone through this big change of 
hospitalization, will or won't they recover, and can they or not go home, and should we be taking mom back home or not? So it's just all this stress, and then they're faced with they're gonna pay $6,000 a month to the nursing home if she can't come home, and how is it gonna do that, and how long is this money gonna last? When does this all end? So what, what, we, what we offer the client is, is they come in and talk to us, we can figure out when they can qualify, how much money this is going to save them, and we can take a lot of worry out of the whole process of, of going through Medicaid. So families definitely need to come talk to us when they're facing these costs before they've spent all their money because we might be able to offer them a better uh, approach, and we've been able to help a lot of families. Now the work for us is, is I don't mean this, first, when we take on these cases, they're, they're all very fact-specific, I mean, we got to get a lot of information and figure out how to, what the best way is for that client. It takes a lot of work. The application, as you guys know, it takes uh, 45 to 75 days before it's going to be approved. And our clients are relying on us to get a successful completion of that. So it's a lot of uh, work and expertise and uh, risk <coughs> for us uh, to, uh, to handle these cases. But the rewards are high because we can have the satisfaction of helping the clients and the rewards are high for the families because a lot of times we can save them a lot of money and worry. Okay, um, so this is a little bit about uh, nursing home costs. Now, we usually say now in the, in the Houston area that the cost of nursing home care is in the five to $7,000 range, but this, this number was in uh, was a Genworth survey. That's one of the long-term insurance providers. And this was in the paper in, in January this year, saying the average in the Houston area was 74.41 for a semi-private room in a nursing home in Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be a little high, but that's what their survey uh, said. At any rate, it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, so how can people pay for long-term care? Well, of course, they can use their own money. They can buy long-term care insurance. They can apply for limited Medicare benefits. Medicare is really for doctors and hospitals that typically only last for a few days or weeks after the medical procedure is over. And then it's your private pay. Uh, become eligible for Medicaid, that's what we were talking about. The other program that is helpful for people is VA aid and attendance. So who's eligible for that? It's, it's um, anyone that served on active duty during a wartime period essentially since World War II. And it turns out there are a lot of wartime periods. So it covers most of the period between the World War II and now. There's a few gaps, but not too many. And so the, the way it works is if you're over 65 and you can and you, you can show VA that you need more money to pay for assisted living or in-home health care or for some kind of care that you need, then the veteran can get a, an allowance of between $1,000 and $2,000 month to cover that. It's not helpful if you need nursing home care under Medicaid because Medicaid will pay the whole cost, whereas the VA is only going to pay $1,500 or $1,000 or $2,000, so it's not enough to cover it, whereas Medicaid will cover the cost of it. Um, so uh, if one, if, and also if you qualify for Medicaid, the VA drops the amount that they provide. So where is VA helpful? It's very helpful when someone is still at that stage where they need help, but they can stay at home. Mm -hmm. If they've got a little help, they can stay at home. That's super helpful. And the other place is in assisted living. So that'll boost up their Social Security so they can cover assisted living. So that's where it's really, really helpful. Um, so it can be expensive. And of course, you already know this, I won't dwell on it too much, but the other problem with, with applications to Medicaid is that uh, if you, if, let's say we put in a Medicaid application, we know how to do it here, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they still get lost or uh, mishandled at Medicaid, inside of the Medicaid thing. And I don't, remember, I don't know if you remember, but Les Berry's still working with the law firm, and he, he's, before he joined us, he worked for Medicaid, so he knows the inside workings of Medicaid. He's one of the few people that I know that can actually um, go in there and, uh, and talk to Medicaid and get them to 
interesting. So it's a huge help for clients. And it's a big problem when people try to do Medicaid applications for themselves. Let's say they do the application, they do it as well as they know how. Maybe they did it right, but it goes into Medicaid and then Medicaid denies it. But the person didn't, they were just lucky to get it done. They just followed the basic instruction, filled it out, sent it in. Now, Medicaid says it's denied. And when they send you back the notices about it, they might as well be written in Greek, right? So the people then, they don't know what to do, how to solve the problem. So it, uh, it's, uh, it's a real, anyway, there's a lot of ways to have a bad time uh, with Medicaid. It's better to, to get, uh, uh, get us to help. Uh, mistake four, funding not maintained or updated. So we, we kind of touched on that earlier, that uh, if you have a trust, we want the, the property in the name of the trust fund, right? Because that's how the trust controls it. The, the account is owned by the trust. The home is owned by the trust. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, if it's owned by the trust, then it doesn't go to probate court, so you don't have to, you don't have to, to uh, go see the judge when somebody passes away in order to transfer the property to the spouse or the kids. So that's one of the advantages of having trust-based planning. But the larger point really is here that when you all are thinking about, so let's just think about basic estate planning. Most married couples have three kinds of property. So you have joint accounts with writers of I think I have a, um, a slide. So most clients have three kinds of accounts. One of those accounts are joint tenancy with right of survivorship. This is your joint checking account, right? So and that so it sounds perfect because it says essentially it says that if one of you passes away, it belongs to the other person. And you don't have to go to probate for it. It doesn't matter what your will says. It doesn't matter what your trust says. What's controlling that is the signature card that you signed when you set up that account. And the law says that's okay, you can do that. And so the financial institution has your account application and where you signed it, it says if one of us dies, uh, their interest, their, their uh, ownership in that account belongs to the other co-tenant. And the law says that's okay. And so um, that's one way to handle it. So a lot of people say, boy, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. No lawyers, no complication, no will. Let's set everything up that way. Well, first thing to say is you can't put your house into joint tenancy with right of survivorship in Texas. It's almost impossible to do that under the law. So, uh, so that's the problem, right? So the house is going to typically be probate property for most people. So that's an example where one major asset you just can't get it into that mode. The other problem with joint tenancy with right of survivorship is that if you both get run over at the same time, the bank doesn't know who to give it to. So you gotta have a will, okay? So even if you have joint accounts, you still need to have a will. Um, and of course, it's always prudent to have a will anyway. Good. Even if you don't have probate property, mm -hmm. you, you wanna have a will just in case you had to get some in the future. Um, So this list, uh, so I said there were three kinds of property. So one of them is joint tenancy with right of survivorship. Another kind of property you guys have are beneficiary designation items. That's IRAs, life insurance, annuities, 401ks are governed by the beneficiary designation. So again, if you name your spouse on an IRA as the beneficiary, it doesn't matter what your will or trust says. It goes to your spouse by that beneficiary designation. And then if you name, on, on these beneficiary designation forms, you can name your kids as contingent beneficiary. How many kids do y'all have? Okay. Okay. So you name your kids as the contingent beneficiary. And so then that property is gonna pass by the beneficiary designation. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, and so that's the second type, beneficiary designation items. And the third type is probate. So what's probate property? Probate property is property that's just in my name. So if it's just in one person's name, there's no pay on death, there's no beneficiary designation, it's just in one person's name, then it's gonna be probate property. So why is that? The reason is that uh, the bank and financial institution doesn't know who, who to give it to, and they're not gonna guess. And so then the solution is, you know, you, the executor has to get a letter from the judge saying they're authorized to go round up the property. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, now, 
on real estate in Texas, when you buy a house and you buy it together, both of your names are going to be on that deed. But it's not joint tenants who write a survivorship. So if one of you passes away, even though it's in both names, the way the law looks at it, it's like, okay, what happened to that deceased person's half? It could have gone to the surviving spouse, if that's what the will says, but it could have gone to the surviving spouse, to the deceased spouse's kids from the first marriage, right? So uh, you have to go to probate court typically unless you have a trust or the home of the trust. Does that make sense on how? Mm -hmm. So this is, you got your three different systems working. So when you're thinking about your state plan, you want it all to work the way that you care about. And there's a lot of ways for this to misfire. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, one way it can misfire, and this happens fairly frequently, is that, is that people have a will. And, uh, and then they've got those other things, beneficiary designations and joint accounts. So they pass away, and the only thing passing under the house, under the, under the will, is the house. And one of the kids is named as the, as the executor. And the executor needs to sell it, maintain it, take care of it, and all that sort of stuff. But the accounts, and the IRA, or the annuity, that all went to everybody, right? I mean, the, the, you know, mom has three kids, and the IRA beneficiary was all three kids. But the estate, the, the probate estate, only has one asset in it, which is the house. But the house, on the house, we need to pay the taxes right away, the property taxes. We need to make sure the lawn is mowed. I gotta make, do some fix up before you put it up on the market. And while it's sitting on the market, I need to pay the utilities and all this stuff. And I'm the executor, and my brother and sister don't seem to be interested in helping me pay for this. And there's no money in the estate to go with this asset. So you see this quite quite a bit. So it's an, all the money went some other way, mm -hmm. and but the house is over here and needs some attention, and the executor's going to have to take a collection or pay for it themselves. Mm -hmm. So sometimes this makes people um, unhappy when they're trying to settle this fight. So that's one example of, of um, a problem that it can cause. Another example of how this would cause a problem, and uh, this happens all too often also. So we have a will, mom or dad has a will, it says I leave all my property to my three beloved children in equal shares, right? That's what the will says. But two of the kids, they live off. And one of the kids lives close by. And the nearby son or daughter has been taking care of mom as in her declining years, right? And so uh, mom says, well, honey, um, if I get sick and stuff, you're going to need to be able to pay bills and stuff. Let me take you down to the bank. So she takes him down to the bank and puts the son or daughter on as joint tenant with right of survivorship on the, the, her savings account and on her checking account and names him or her as the primary beneficiary on her IRA, okay? So then the, uh, the, uh, she passes away and the kids know the will goes equally to everyone and at the funeral they say, well, you, you know, they know she's been taking care of mom. They say, well, what do we do about the state and everything? I saw you're the executor that's nearby and uh, the nearby a uh, son or daughter might say, well, um, the house is the only thing passing under her will, right? Because all these other accounts went straight to the nearby son or daughter. Mm -hmm. So the kids are only going to get one third of the house when the executor gets around to selling it. Right? Well, but the family's not going to be happy with each other after this, right? They're going to be mad. So you can see a lot, a lot of times that this occurs. So I had a case. Uh, let, me see, let me see if I can on this one is. Um, so I had this case where this, uh, this the dad passed away and the estate, it was just about $1.5 million. Okay? And the nearby daughter, and, and so um, the nearby daughter got herself on or made herself the beneficiary of approximately $1 million of the $1.5 million. So when dad passed away, a million went straight to her, okay? So there's still $500,000, and the will says divided equally among the kids, except it said 
that he wanted to make specific distributions to two of the grand. <laughs> daughter got a million plus a hundred thousand dollars plus her kid got the specific one of the specific distributions and her other two her brother and sister each got a hundred thousand were they happy no <laughs> so so it, the whole thing miscarried and nobody's gonna ever speak to each other again it, I, I don't think they went to lawsuit city but a lot of times that kind of stuff goes to lawsuits so that's an example of where the, the dad didn't understand, you know, maybe he was way up in years and stuff, he just didn't understand the implications of what he was doing. And this happens a lot. People think when they sign a will that that changed all the other accounts. It like grabbed them and divided them. Not so. So this is one of the misconceptions that people have that you need to be careful about. Mistake number six, assets in the plan are unsuitable for family goals. Many clients have a hodgepodge of investments they've acquired over the years. They're depending on them to support them in retirement or find an estate for theirs. Then you have no idea what they have or if they're suitable. So we actually see this a lot, and it takes a bunch of different forms. So, you know, we have our life savings. It takes a long time to put your life savings together, and it's going to supplement your, your Social Security and your other uh, retirement pension if you have that. So our life savings is mighty important to us. And what we would like to do is we'd like to get a decent return over time on this money and use it wisely. Uh, so it's available for retirement and if we've accumulated whatever's left after we're gone, we want to go to the kids. So what are the pro why is this a problem? Well, the classic problem is that a lot of times people worry about how much fees they're paying or they worry about um, worry about a lot of things but oftentimes the biggest problem is that the husband and wife don't aren't really on the same sheet of music about how the investments work and so if let's say the husband's been managing the investments and he's fairly comfortable with that and he passes away now the wife she, she was familiar with what he was doing, and she was comfortable with it while he was around, but she wasn't responsible for it. Now she's responsible for it. And what's the market doing? It's doing whatever it's doing. Like last fall, it kept going down like this, and it was making everybody really nervous. Well, so, so what does this, the surviving spouse do? The surviving spouse moves the assets to a bank CD or moves them to an annuity because it sounds like that's a lot safer and it's not getting all this volatility going. And a lot frequently when that's done, the effect is to take a loss because the, what, got, what caused the, the surviving spouse to do something was fear of the market decline. So they sell and put it into a CD or the annuity salesman talks them into buying an annuity at that point because they, the annuity salesman says, this is what you need, it won't go down, it'll just go up. Who can argue, I mean, that's such a wonderful argument that, that appeals to a lot of people. It doesn't matter that it's not a very helpful uh, way to look at things. But at any rate, as a result, the portfolio goes from here to here, and now it is stuck permanently in many cases, because once it's in an annuity, it's gonna be tied up for a long period of time, or if it's in a CD, unless uh, frequently people don't change. So here's what happens to the life savings. Somewhere in here, there's this lack of continuity, and it takes a big chunk out of it, and now it can't increase anymore because it's out of the market, right? And then the kids get it. Now, the kids may be smart, but the problem, and they might even be responsible, but a lot of times the kids really don't have much of an idea, as it turns out, about exactly what to do with their investments. The first problem is that if you listen to radio, or to watch TV, you know that like those Schwab commercials, even a baby can invest in the stock market is what you get that impression. Or you listen on the radio, when I'm coming to work, I hear about the online trading academy. There is no there there. This is not an investment plan. This is just gambling. It won't work. It doesn't work. Um, it's, anyway, so all of this stuff tends to make people, when they first receive an inheritance, overly confident about their 
ability to invest and win big. And the result is they invest and lose the chunk of the startup things. And I'm terrible. So there's another haircut as they're getting started with this. The other thing that happens when people inherit money is even the responsible ones, they're not sure what to do with it. And it's funny, but what I see is the husband and wife save this money over decades, right? And then they, they, in many cases, they were very careful with it during their retirement. And now the kids inherit it. And they're, they're in their 40s, maybe 50s, they're, and they're responsible, they have responsible jobs and so forth. So they say to the kids, go, I wonder what I ought to do with this. And so they, it's like all of a sudden there's this burden that's fallen on them to do something with the inheritance. So one thing is they can go to the online trading academy. That's not too good. But another thing that the prudent ones will do is they'll say, you know what? I'm going to pay off my credit cards uh, and I'm, I'm going to pay off my mortgage. That is something prudent to do, long-term planning. Well, maybe I'll just get a bigger house. You know, maybe I'll just get a bigger house. Maybe we'll get a bigger house. And, uh, and I pay off those credit cards. And then uh, the next year comes, and you know what? I've been always wanting a swimming pool in my backyard. And I got a little bit of money now. I think maybe I'll do that. That's, that's a good investment. We'll use that for years and years. And you know my car? That car is tiny. But I, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, have a car loan, so I'll just take one. And even big fortunes can't take that kind of punishment for very many years before they are a small fortune. You know the joke was. That the best way to, to get a small fortune is to start with a large fortune. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's sad but true. Okay? So what do I think is the best way for them to view this? I think the way they should view this is if they get your life savings, they better never spend it. Ever. Their job is to treat be stewards of it. And what they should do is take distributions each year equal to what that money can earn reasonably and with the yeah, idea that they would have this as, as sort of a permanent asset base that's security for them and they for the grandkids yeah. if they can be good stewards of it. The families that are blessed are those few that have enough prudence and sense to be able to maintain assets from generation to generation. For, for most of us, all our life, if we wanted another dime, we had to go out and work, right? Well, there's a few people that actually have a few dimes coming in because there's an asset base back there somewhere, right? And for most of us who have been working towards retirement, we're creating some asset base. If that could last a long time and be a benefit for us and then for our kids, that'd be wonderful. But they got to all understand the game. So uh, to me, it's a real shame that, that so many families have trouble with this. Um, and so one of my goals is to try to help families with that. So you know, I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I'm a CPA, and I also have a financial advisory firm. So we try to help families with their investments and to avoid those kinds of plan, uh, problems. Okay, families not aware of the situation. So this varies from family to family. There are some families that are very open about money and the, you know, the coordination among the family is pretty good. Um, in other families, they don't want to talk about it, so that's obviously going to create a problem or likely to create a lack of communication. But let's just talk about a few ideas that, that come up along this line. The first thing to say is that if you talk to your kids about estate planning, the first thing they say, they try to stop you from talking about it. Your kids, as a general rule, do not want the parents to talk about dying and right. leaving the estate. So right off the bat, there's this hesitancy to engage the, the topic. But it's important that whoever's going to be executor or trustee to have some idea of where is this stuff? <laughs> what am I going to have to do? How, how is it organized? How would I find where your stuff is if, you, if, if something happened to you? So we do need to brief them on that. Also, what we want the, one of the biggest worries, or should be the biggest worries, for families is that period, well, so right now we're hale and hearty so we can take care of each other, right? Then, if you're, for married couples, as the world turns, one of them is gonna 
be is going to decline before the other one. And the healthy spouse is going to take care of the one that's, that's not doing it right. And that, so the first spouse to become feeble is less likely to need nursing home care, less likely to need in-home care. Less likely to run to cause trouble with the assets or, or loss of control of that because the other spouse is care. doing it, taking care of it. It's the surviving spouse that frequently has the greatest risk of, of the estate um, um, being lost. So, what I mean by that is that. Because we're all living longer and longer, it looks like more of us are going to outlive our brains. And so the effect of this is that during the last year of our life, the last two years, the last three years, we're not going to be running on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. During that period, this is the time when there's oftentimes marriages, there's scams, there's caretakers, there's uh, cohabitation. And so all kinds of things happen. And it's a very, um, it's, it can frequently happen that um, people with assets lose control of them during that period. And if there's another person comes into play, that could be the nearby son or daughter, that could be the caretaker, that could be the new spouse, that could be the new partner. They're going to get power of attorney, and they get power of attorney, and rearrange your estate plan. Right? So, just think about that. The way you structure your, your estate plan can should be so that if you ever get to where you can't manage, control shifts back to your kids and, and away from any of these other players there so that the family has control of the situation and also can make sure that things are handled on. So the trust is, is very helpful in this role. The other thing that's very helpful is to make sure that your agents, trustee, um, know where things are, know how things are set up, and that there's an understanding that if you start to lose it, they need to, they need to make sure that everything stays in the right spot. Right? Yeah. So you, I don't know if you all have seen this, but it certainly is a very common um, set of issues and worries. Okay, if there are unequal distributions, this is a huge problem, okay? So if, 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 you know, all the kids are expecting to get an equal share, if they don't get an equal share, they, it's, they're not gonna be happy about this. Um, also, if it's a second marriage situation, a lot of times all kinds of drama can develop around the, the uh, assets. And so if you, you know, another odd thing is a lot of times when people think they've been appointed executor or trustee, it's like, well, I'm in the catbird seat, right? Wrong. They are the ones that are going to get all the blame. They're financially responsible for everything. And so uh, being an executor or trustee is a big responsibility. And if there's going to be unequal distribution, they're going to be right in the middle of it, right? So they may not be very happy campers if they get all that blowback. So good planning needs to anticipate this problem as much as possible. And it probably means good communication in your family. And, and there may be other particular actions that you can take to forestall problems. So hopefully that's not one of your issues, but it certainly does come up a lot about unequal distribution. Um, let me see what else I can say about that. Okay, here's another thing. Some families, this is not a problem. What we're talking about are guns, jewelry, and household items. Okay? So guns, jewelry, and household items are technically probate property. But if that's all we're talking about, nobody's going to go to probate court typically over guns, jewelry, and household items. Uh, if we have a trust, we're going to transfer them into the trust, and it just takes one piece of paper and you sign, it, sign the property to the trust. But that's not, what I'm, that's not really where the big problem is. The problem is that in some families, this is extremely touchy about who gets uh, you know, uh, dad's gun collection, or who gets mom's um, jewelry. I had a, one of my largest clients, uh, largest estate clients, had four kids and this big estate and equal distributions to the four kids on it. So all, after mom dies, they're each going to be multi and equal to the joy, right? Just joy. Well, they got in 
a squabble over the stuff in the house before the funeral. <laughs> and they never got over fighting about that stuff. They are still steamed about it. Yes, yeah, and so in some families there needs to be a great deal of care <laughs> about the handling of these these things. Um, uh, so it just depends on your your family. <laughs> so it's a funny thing. So this is this is good advice. And depending on the family, having some discussion about it when you get your like if you do your estate planning with us if you update the stuff you might want to talk to the whole family or at least your executive or trustee and give them an idea of what's cooking as part of your uh, plan and if there are any particular issues about things that need to be done that might be a good time to identify whether that was so one of the problem one of the ways that that business about guns jewelry and household items go well let's say the grandmother or the mother said I wanted this ring to go to so and so well then, after the, they go, after mom dies, they're all scrambling through the house looking for stuff, and they don't find the ring. And then all of a sudden, there's suspicion arises. <laughs> Who got that ring, right? Or the other, another version of this is um, uh, one of the kids says, uh, "You know that beautiful ring that mom had? She said that I should get that." And this other girl says, "No, oh, no, she told me I should get it." Well, so the war's on, right? Mm -hmm. So you get into all that stuff. So the clarity on this may help uh, a great deal on the, some of that stuff. Okay, another thing about our study that says plan does not reflect family values or life lessons. So um, when people pass away and there's a will or a trust or whatever, in the normal scheme of things, there is no necessary record about the family relationships, family tree, where people are from. And so many times the family, after, after this generation is gone, the next generation can't really remember many specific details about their grandparents because they used to rely on their mom and all that stuff about all the cousins and uh, brothers and all, that whole, the other generation and the generation before, and now they passed away and that repository is gone. So we think that for many families that they would want to have that information, have some repository. Uh, in other families, that's really not the most likely, not the thing on their mind, but what is on their mind is that they have certain keepsakes or certain family traditions or certain um, family albums that are important as a family tradition or reflective of family tradition that they want to um, uh, they want to tell their kids about or remember. And so we think that in your estate planning documents, with your estate planning documents, that uh, for many families they would be happy to have a section where you would keep information about where you grew up, who your parents were, who your brothers and sisters were, and, and, some, and things about you and your family. And that this would be a great treasure after you're gone for your kids. Right? And so in our, when we're doing the living trust, we have a, uh, um, it's like a, a little book and it asks a bunch of questions about people. So if you fill that out, you will have left a record about a lot of your aspects of your own life and education, what you did, did for, in this life. Also, um, uh, for some families, uh, this is also a place to record things like, don't forget um, that, uh, uh, that box of photos, mm -hmm. or don't forget about the uh, collage that talks about when you were growing up, that has a picture of when you were growing up, mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing that's part of your family uh, tradition. So uh, one of the things when we're thinking about you know, you know, after we're gone, we might we think, well, I wonder if we'll make any uh, impression. But the impression that most of us have the opportunity to make is that if we have good family traditions, the reason they're good family uh, traditions is that they are protective of us and our kids. And so, in the great scheme of things, we'd like to pass the good, protective family traditions on to our kids and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So that's also a chance to say something about that, perhaps. 
So anyway, that's a, another aspect of our site plan. You know, when you go to the cemetery, it's 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 sort of sad or something that you know there's the birthday, the birth year, and then there's a hyphen, mm -hmm. and then there's the death, and mm -hmm. it's like, you know, what happened in between? <laughs> the other thing that I always noticed, and I don't know what to make of it exactly, but when I go to to funerals and I'm looking at the the, uh, the gravestones, you see what I just said: the birth date and the death date and a hyphen. But so a lot of them have some reference to the fact that they served, say, in World War II or something. There's something on the tombstone for the veterans that's on there, and uh, probably put on there by a veterans organization, you know, or something after the after the fact. But if you think about it, that's nice. But that was really a s awfully small segment for most people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, somebody, we'd like to make more of a mark, and I'm not sure what the solution is, but mm -hmm. part of it's good family tradition. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's an idea about some of the mistakes that people make, and what I hope that helps is in thinking about your estate planning, about whether it's up to date or there's something you all need, need to do or want to do. Okay? And so we've got a, um, sheet there if you need to make an appointment or like to uh, talk about anything. I'm available for questions if you have questions. Do we need a break or anything? No. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. So let's see, we have this uh, that uh, little thing that talks about a place to uh, things that might be of interest if you want to have a new